Hello everyone, my name is Tudor Popescu and I'm giving this third talk in the in our symposium. I will give in my talk first an introduction into the general field of uh, study of music language parallels, which is uh, an area I, I specialize in, and I will try to make this interconverge to the common area of interest that we have in this um, conference, or at least in the symposium, which is of course poetry. Um, and using this uh, introduction, I will then uh, more briefly describe uh, a study which we would have liked to have the data for to already been collected, but which is, as it stands, still in, in, in planned mode. So I will indulge more in a slightly longer introduction to hopefully make for a good justification of this uh, study, which I will just brush over at the, at the end of the presentation. So just to give an introduction, I would say about music and language that uh, often they are described as having a special relationship. Um, and what this uh, means is that beyond them being obviously distinctive cognitive capacities for the human species, um, the two specific affinities that they, that they share quite deeply are first of all evolutionary uh, one, which means that people are uncertain as to um, exactly when in human um, evolution, music and language came uh, to be different things. Um, Darwin reckoned that music appeared first as a desire to um, charm the opposite uh, sex in his words. So he assumed, in other words, that music played there was some, some role in sexual selection in, uh, in Homo sapiens. And that later on, uh, in, in, at some point later in the evolution, a language bifurcated and uh, spin off from, from music, adding propositionality and then kind of uh, becoming a thing of, of its own. Um, other people after Darwin had uh, different ideas uh, about exactly the order in which these um, two specializations occurred, but they, uh, what is certain is that there is a, a deep and intertwined um, evolutionary trajectory that the two domains share. And second of all, music and language have uh, similar similarities in how they internally structure their uh, building blocks, so to say. So both of them consist of uh, discrete acoustical elements, um, which can be notes forming uh, chords, forming phrases, forming sections, and so on in, in music, just like we have uh, phonemes form, forming words, forming sentences, forming discourse, and so on up, up a tree in the case of, of language. So this kind of hierarchical nesting in, in both uh, domains is, is another uh, obvious similarity in between the two. Um, indeed, this sort of uh, tree-like uh, structure for the two domains has been proposed to, um, to be a fundamental for how uh, syntax in, in music can be analyzed in a similar way as can syntax in, in language, uh, ever since uh, Lerdal and Jackendorf proposed their generative theory of, of tonal music. Um, and in fact, this um, some evolutionary psychologists like Tikam de Fitch um, believes that the human propensity to uh, arrange incoming uh, stimuli in a, in a tree-like form that can be parsed uh, hierarchically um, is in fact strong enough for the species that it can be uh, referred to as, as a species-specific trait. And he called this specific one dendrophilia, so the, the tendency to, to kind of organize mental trees. So all of these things together really suggest, um, it may, makes it hardly a surprise that people have found using fMRI and other techniques um, that there are neural resources between music and the processing of syntax in music and language that are shared. Um, and so the way that uh, music and language are both make infinite use of finite means to use a famous expression is really formally through recursion. So just like language takes um, meaningless phonemes and puts them into meaningful words that can then be uh, arranged together into an infinite number of propositions, so uh, what's been called for duality of patterning in, in language, uh, music does um, a similar thing by uh, typically organizing its pitches from continuous into a, a discrete space of pitches, if you think about things like scales. Uh, and then nesting its phrases into larger phrases and to uh, larger musical forms, um, etc. So these, these two processes are, are similarly uh, recursive. 
And so special relationships such as those I've, I've described um, make, make people uh, assume that um, they, the, the source of, of the, the special relationship is likely due to what is known in evolutionary psychology as homology. So in other words, the assumption that there was a, a common ancestor and that common ancestor was relatively recent as opposed to an analogy. So the, the, the two uh, adaptations having evolved uh, independently. Um, as is shown here classically uh, in the case of vocal learning, which kind of appeared in, in, in humans and in songbirds independently uh, without there being a common ancestor to speak uh, of, as is the case of, of humans and chimpanzees in this, in this other image. And as for this uh, common ancestor between musical language, there is, of course, a lot of speculation. A famous term is uh, by Stephen Brown is called music language, but there are, of course, other uh, so-called evolutionary or so evolutionary scenarios that are rather difficult to, to test, unfortunately. Now, a lens through which uh, many people find it useful to examine the differences, this time, in addition to the similarities between music and language, have to do with so-called design features. So Hockett first described those for, for language. Um, he was referring to um, paradigmatic uh, properties of, of language that, that, um, that are uh, kind of defining features of it, especially when it comes to comparing it to, um, to other systems of communication, such as uh, animal calls. Um, the similarities, some of the similarities I described earlier, uh, prompted uh, people to come up with a, with a set of design features for, for, for music in, the, in this case, by analogy, and this was also by Tecumse uh, Fitch. And then the framework that I that I would like to briefly describe here uh, is um, proposed by Heiduk and Fitch recently in a Frontiers in Psychology paper, whereby the differences between music and language um, are a corollary of how these two domains are used uh, differently or are sort of dif differentially de deployed their usages, so to speak, along three axes that they postulate to be propositional to aesthetic, novel to repetitive, and choric dialogic. Um, so to take this one, for instance, um, music would be choric in the sense that it tends to be done at the same time by different people uh, with pay special attention paid to synchronization, whereas uh, dial language is dialogic in the sense that there is kind of turn-taking between speakers at both at the same time. Um, likewise, language is propositional, whereas uh, music is more uh, aesthetic and music tends to use repetition more than language does. And of course, there are many hybrid uh, or degenerate cases whereby you would find music, in fact, being um, on the opposite end of the, of the axis. But the idea would be that this is the exception rather than the rule. And so many of these uh, differences that we can uh, conceptualize between music and language can be most parsimoniously described by using such a system of uh, three axes. Um, so having that in, in mind, the propositional goal that language has would lead us to believe that uh, the rate of information in, in, in language is more or less on average constant, which is in fact what studies in computational linguistics find, and that uh, music's largely aesthetic goal leads it to have a less uniform rate of, of information. Now, as for poetry, which I'm, I'm trying slowly to, to get to, uh, would be expected to be a case in between music and, and language, of course. And so the prediction would be that uh, its rate of information likewise is less uniform. Um, and in fact, this is what becomes the aesthetic object that is, uh, in itself, is that poetry has this as a degree of freedom um, to, to, to vary and to take licenses with, so to speak. And the way it might do that has been well described in, in a classical um, as well as more recent uh, text um, as kind of a, having an arch-based trajectory whereby the listener is taken from initial expectation to a combination of sorts of surprise and then finally a resolution. So now throughout the species of, of uh, throughout the evolution, sorry, of, uh, of the species, um, vocalizations ended up having an, an increased specialization. And so um, different, these different roles in social uh, interactions prompted the, the vocalization system, so the physiological vocalization system in, in humans, vocal tracts and so on, to likewise differentiate um, 
Indeed, such differentiation processes are uh, abundant in both biological evolution as well as in cultural uh, evolution, so the, this hypothesis is plausible. Um, and the hypothesis specifically that the spectrotemporal features of these vocalizations likewise polarized. So from some initial uh, difficult to describe, very speculative uh, primordial soup of music language, it became differentiated in, into two uh, poles um, whereby music and language are, are two stealth standing domains, each with its own set of features, like I described before. And once again, poetry sits as a kind of a surviving hybrid form in between the two that affords novel uh, pragmatic ways of vocalized social interaction. So this is how I propose to, to think of poetry in this, in this case. Now, just a word about musical syntax, which is by now largely an accepted uh, notion. Um, if we think about structure building for musical phrases, this is something that can refer to several conceptual uh, level, uh, so referring to several of music's features. So one can speak of grouping syntax that generates things like uh, phrases and subphrases and, and sections, or rhythmic syntax that gives us things like uh, metric grids and so on. Um, and we can have harmonic uh, syntax, which is uh, getting closer to the to the core of the study I'm about to describe. And harmonic syntax syntax is simply the relationship between uh, notes and then higher up between chords, uh, centered around some uh, some some tonal points that is kind of defined to be the most stable point. So in this case, the root of a chord or the tonic of a of a key. And then any chord progression, so any, any musical piece, uh, is kind of described as, as a sequence of harmonic functions that converges uh, towards equilibrium. So it is, more technically speaking, coming back to the tonic in the most typical uh, case. And of course, these different levels of syntax all operate simultaneously as we hear music, um, as well as when we hear speech or poetry, of course. Now, most of the work that has been done comparing, comparing uh, music and language has tended to look at the interaction of uh, harmony and phrasal syntax in language, or harmony and, and semantics in, in uh, language. However, um, I hope it makes sense at this point that despite the hypothesized um, sharing of neural resources in musical language, for, for which, as I said, there is in fact good uh, neuroimaging evidence, we do need more specific parallels between kind of finer grained syntactical elements of musical language. And this is how I arrive at, at poetry as a poetic structure. Uh, I, I'm sorry, this is how I arrive at rhyme as a poetic uh, a structure, because rhyme, um, like meter, adds a parallel level of linguistic structure building, namely the phonological level. Now, we know that um, Rhyme has the um, effect of um, facilitating cognitive processing. So if you have target words that rhyme with a preceding word in a behavioral uh, task, we, we notice that uh, such target words are easier to process. And at the neural level, if we use EG to record um, uh, event-related potentials, we notice smaller such uh, ERPs, uh, specifically the ones that kind of index uh, surprise. And so this will suggest that rhyme, it is possible that rhyme operates with some mechanism of increased perceptual fluency um, or equivalently of decreased uh, cognitive uh, load. So it makes sense that even though rhyme is something that's independent of semantics and does not contribute to phrasal syntax per se, it nonetheless can align with syntactic borders. Um, like prosody does, as, as we've seen in, in, in Courtney's uh, presentation. And as such, rhyme can, can constitute a, a, a form, uh, albeit a very simple form of long distance dependency, um, whereby, you know, hearing a first line of poetry um, prompts in a listener, assuming that the rhyme scheme is known, an expectation of the ending of the second line, and when this ending uh, arrives, this can either confirm the presentation, the, the, the prediction by, by rhyming, um, or it cannot. Um, so rhyme would, can be seen as a, as a form of phonological syntax that kind of builds hierarchies at the syllabic uh, level. So now, why did we want to pair rhyme with harmony in this particular uh, case? It was to test the intuition that rhyme may be more similar in terms of uh, shared resources, 
to harmonic syntax in music than it is to phrasal syntax in, in, uh, in language. So this is what I will uh, describe now as, as I describe the, the study. The goal of it, of the study, um, we, uh, we, we describe it as evaluating the degree to which phonological structure building, independent of semantics or phrasal syntax, interacts with harmonic structure building. And specifically, we aimed to link uh, information theoretic measures of musical language um, to, uh, first of all, brain markers that we would record using uh, EG and pupillometry, as I'll describe on the next slide, and to specific notions from the predictive coding framework. Now, very briefly, for those of you not familiar with this um, very influential framework in cognitive neuroscience, the idea is that uh, perception works by continuously having, uh, by, by the brain continuously generating predictions that can be described as being at two levels. So first of all, we have an expectation about uh, what it is specifically that, that is perceived. So this would be a first order prediction regarding the content of the, of the percept itself. And second of all, that there is an uh, expect, a so-called expectancy, which is a second order prediction that qualifies how much saliency or, or, or precision is ascribed to that first order prediction. And so what we want to do in the study is to combine structure building in musical language by using a single stream, so namely uh, songs, vocal, uh, vocal uh, songs with lyrics in this case. And we want to combine these uh, elements together. So lyrics, harmony, and melody in a unified representations, um, which makes, of course, for an ecological paradigm using naturalistic simile. And those two hypotheses that we, we, uh, we came up with are, first of all, the one I mentioned is that rhyme shares more with harmonic syntax than to phrasal syntax. And second of all, that there is, um, when, when there is congruency between rhyme and harmony, this is the case that when rhyme facilitates harmonic processing, whereas it inhibits it in the incongruent case. And the way we'd go about doing that is we would compose um, four-part harmonies uh, in, a, in the chorale tradition of Western music, basing them on a corpus of German poems that provides uh, lyrics. And this is an example from a, from a Goethe poem. Uh, so this corpus entails taking um, actual stanzas from these uh, poems and then modifying them by uh, so manipulating the, the rhyme, taking out the, the rhyme, but leaving meter intact, and then replacing the, the actual words with, with pseudo words that maintain otherwise all the, the same magical grid and the same manipulations for rhyme and meter, as in this example uh, here. Um, and the idea is that we would build a, a continuum of prediction in each of the two domains, music and language, by manipulating specifically the information flow that we have in each dimension. Um, in language, this amounts to controlling the amount of prediction at the next possible uh, rhyme. For you, so by, by using, so uh, rhymes are more or less intense, half versus whole rhyme, and that are, um, you know, whose onsets are at the expected time versus slightly earlier or slightly late. And the music to that would be chord progressions that are text set to, 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 to those lyrics that bring um, uh, more or less of a, of a musical closure by, by playing around with those harmonic functions that I, that I hinted at. And so what this creates is a continuum, likewise, uh, in terms of congruency, going from all the way fully congruent, such as a whole rhyme occurring on a tonic chord, um, to full incongruence, so this whole rhyme occurring instead on a, on a very unexpected chord, such as a Neapolitan chord or something. And the idea is that we would uh, compute information density at each time point, so at the chord and at the phoneme level, uh, and we would do that not just within each domain, but also between the music and language domains, um, which gives us in information theoretic terms what's known as a joint information density. Um, uh, and the information theoretic measure that we would uh, compute is uh, referred to uh, as uncertainty or surprise. There's a, a slight difference among these two. And this would be given to us by a computational uh, model, uh, very popular in music cognition, uh, the idiom model. Uh, and I'm happy to, of course, to give more details about this when we uh, have the Q&A. But the idea is that subjects would first hear these uh, stimuli and uh, would be asked to, uh, to detect uh, harmonic closure, so in other words, when they feel that, that the music comes to a, to a, to a harmonic uh, ending, of a, to a phrase ending. And second of all, they would be asked to listen to the same stimuli uh, in a passive uh, way, uh, 
whereby EEG and uh, eye tracking is, is recorded from them. So in the EEG, there are specific um, sources that we have reason to suspect might constitute a more or less of a hub for phonological processing and, and areas such as the superior temporal uh, sulcus in the left hemisphere is what we'll be trying to target. And second of all, the EEG will be combined with eye tracking um, and specifically, we will be looking at the pupil dilation uh, response so rather than using eye tracking as, um, as Judy did in her study by um, at looking at, at gaze time, gaze duration. We will be extracting the pupil dilation uh, dynamically throughout time. And this pupil dilation response or, or PDR has been repeatedly shown to be a reproducible index of cognitive arousal, um, which can also include surprise and attention. So in the case of music, people have shown that the, that the average PDR is modulated by music that is more emotional or surprising or groovy or stimulating in, in several ways. Um, what we want to do now and what would be novel here is that we would have, um, we would hope that PDR is, and there are good reasons to believe that it also indexes moment by moment uh, prediction. And this of course can happen at different time scales. Uh, phonemes and words, etc., in the case of uh, language, and likewise um, you know, chords and phrases in the case of, of music. And coming back for a second to the predictive coding um, framework, we reckon that what PDR is specifically tracking is prediction error, which is defined in this framework to exist at uh, both of these uh, orders that I define, so both first and second order uh, predictions. Um, and we would control for things that people know uh, can confound the, the average PDR, things that have to do with individual differences in, 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 uh, in all of these parameters listed here. Um, now, essentially, the analysis would be looking at an, uh, a, a correlation between the information theoretic measures and the physiological data from the PDR EEG uh, within each subject. And what we reckon would constitute evidence for the first hypothesis, so the one that rhyme is closer to harmony than the phrasal syntax, is kind of finding, uh, minimizing in that joint information density that I described to kind of bridge rhyme and harmony, corresponds to, to peaks in the, in the PDR signal or to relevant um, ERPs that have to do uh, with, with uh, a surprisal, uh, such as the N400, P600, uh, there are a couple of other ones as well. Um, on the other hand, what would constitute evidence for the second hypothesis, the one about congruency, is seeing that these physiological uh, signals uh, can vary with a joint information density uh, more than they do with, um, with the information density computed within each domain taken, taken separately. Now, of course, I suspect that we have a broad range of backgrounds in, uh, in this symposium, um, and I'm, I, have, I have no doubt probably taken a heavy-handed uh, approach to poetry um, in this study. Uh, and since I expect that many of you will know a lot more about poetry than, than I do, I'm very much looking forward to hearing feedback on the design of the, of the study and its justification um, that I uh, hope we can discuss in person in, in, uh, at the conference. So with that, I thank my collaborators and the people who've uh, brainstormed with me uh, about this and other studies, and I look forward to chatting to you in person. Thank you very much.